Hi, it's Katrina. Are you ready for some strange and bizarre artifacts? Then let's jump right in. The Medici Chapels The Medici family was so powerful, they continue to shape history to this day. You know the Medici family, I'm sure. They clawed their way to the top by any means necessary to become the most powerful and influential family of their day. They were political masterminds and were extremely important in Italy during the Middle Ages. They even had their own official church in Florence called San Lorenzo. What began as the official church for the Medici family and their wealthy friends to see and be seen by God and everyone else is now their eternal resting place. The Medici Chapel started in 1429 with Giovanni di Vici de' Medici. He wished to be buried inside the church with his wife. Then his son wanted to be buried there as well. By 1520, a hugely expensive project started to build an official family tomb for all of the Medicis to be together. Of course, they got the best of the best to work on their chapels. For you art history fans, you probably already know this, but Michelangelo was a huge part of this project. The great artist Michelangelo was hired to help build an entire section. Not just paint things, but actually build what is known as the New Sacristy between 1520 and 1534. 14 years he spent on this. He made incredible sculptures, such as the statues of the Dukes of Lorenzo and Giuliano. His Allegory of Night, as seen in the new sacristy, is regarded as one of his finest works. But we aren't here just to talk about the Medici. Their statues and chapels are beautiful and impressive. But besides all that, there is something very strange. Among the marble statues is a very, very weird one. There is a work by Silvio Cosini called Military Trophies. The statue is of a headless torso with some sort of creature coming out of his spine. Located in a hallway right before Michelangelo's new sacristy, this statue is very hard to understand. Is it a torso with sleeves? Is it an armor breastplate? People have described the thing in the neck as a worm or a caterpillar, but perhaps if you look at it differently, it might also be the top of a spinal cord. There is very little information about this sculpture, so if you have any guesses as to what it is and what you think the thing represents, let me know in the comments. Besides this odd statue, there were other artists who completed other statues within the larger complex of San Lorenzo as well. There is also a crypt that was used to house the corpses of the other members of the dynasty. The Chapel of the Princes houses six of the Medici Grand Dukes, but it's really the new sacristy that captures everyone's attention because of artists like Michelangelo, Montorsoli, and Baccio. In 1976, historians made a great discovery. They found drawings and sketches tucked away in a small area of the church. These appear to be doodles left behind by an artist, most likely Michelangelo. They were likely made as he went about creating his masterpieces. There are 56 drawings in total, showing everything from human legs to masks and architectural ideas. Have you ever been here or do you want to go? Let us know in the comments. The Oton Gold Death Mask In the past, many cultures would bury the dead in gold masks. You might turn to dust, but gold lives on forever. On June 5, 1967, archaeological excavations in San Antonio revealed an incredible death mask from the 14th or 15th century. It's one of the most unique funerary masks ever discovered in Southeast Asia. This isn't San Antonio in Texas, it's the one in the Philippines. Covering the face of a newly deceased person is a burial practice that can be seen across the world. Ancient Egyptians put funerary masks on their mummies, jade death masks were placed over the twisted faces of dead Mayan kings, and the Greeks would put gold coins on dead people's eyes. The incredible Oton gold death mask is one of very few golden masks recovered from ancient Asia, with others located in Indonesia, Vietnam, and southern India. But just what is a death mask and what were they used for 500 years ago? In the Philippines, it was a culture known as the Bisayan, who placed gold coverings in the eyes, nose, and mouth of a dead person. This was a way to prevent evil spirits from slipping into the dead body and potentially turning it into a zombie. It was thought the brightness of the gold warded off evil. 
Over time, the gold coverings evolved into ornate death masks, just like this one. What do you think? Are you a fan? Would you want one? Or is it too creepy? The Pyramid Texts In the ancient past, magic and science were pretty blended together. Everything had a special meaning and was done for a reason that we just don't understand in our modern world. Take, for example, the Pyramid's texts found in Egypt. Egyptologists argue that ancient texts left behind were most likely used for funerals and strict rituals because that is the only proof that we have. Others, like author and researcher Jeremy Nadler, are convinced otherwise. Jeremy and his colleagues believe the sacred funerary work, known as the Pyramid Texts, were used for hypnosis and putting people into a trance. The pyramid texts are incredibly odd. They aren't a single book or even really a tangible artifact. The term pyramid text is used to describe a series of inscribed texts found in ancient graves over a span of about 180 years. In 1881, Gaston Maspero uncovered mysterious texts engraved on the inside of the tomb walls of Pharaoh Unas, who ruled around 2345 BC. All these years later, examples of the exact same text have been found on the walls of tombs from between the 5th dynasty and the 8th dynasty, but none before and none after. There also are no pyramid texts inside the pyramids. For two centuries, the pyramid texts were engraved inside the tombs of extremely important people. Each block of text contained roughly 750 magic words of power and divine names. Because the example in Unas' tomb is the only complete version, with the rest being partial or fragmented, it's been studied a lot. Scientists are confident the magic spells in the text were meant to help the deceased on their journey into the afterlife. Some of the words and phrases are a little strange. For example, there are recurring lines that say, Unas, wake up! Unas has not died. And in other places, there are instructions saying, Awake, turn yourself about. O king, stand up and sit down to a thousand beers. It seems as if the magic spells were trying to break the king out of the trance of death so that he might be resurrected. Jeremy suggested that the spells were designed to wake the dead king and force his spirit to return to his body. Sounds a lot like necromancy. What do you think? And now for a quick break, because it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Gidget and Candy McGraw for supporting this channel. Thanks so much for watching and spending time with us. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already for more videos like this. The Head of the Virgin On the morning of August 9th, 1945, the world changed forever. An atomic bomb fell on Nagasaki destroying the city in a way that will never be forgotten. What a lot of people don't know is that the bomb landed about 1,600 feet from the Urakami Cathedral. It didn't obliterate the building, but it was mostly destroyed. There are a few pieces of the church still left, and one of them is the head of the Virgin Mary. Miraculously, the head of Jesus Christ's mother survived the atomic detonation. Of course, it isn't her physical head. Japan does not claim to have the actual head of the Virgin Mother. It's a wooden head that was blasted off a statue of the Virgin Mary during the bombing. It's one of the only surviving artifacts from the explosion, used in a peaceful memorial procession every year on the anniversary of the event. You might be wondering what a Christian church is doing in Japan. Aren't the Japanese practitioners of Buddhism and Shinto? Mostly, yes. 70% of the population in Japan practices Shinto, while 67% practices Buddhism. You might be wondering why this adds up to more than 100%, and it's actually because some people practice both Shinto and Buddhism. The peaceful harmony of these two religions allows them to overlap. You can practice both. A tiny fragment of 1.5% of all Japan, according to the government, practices Christianity. The fact the atomic bomb dropped so close to one of the very few Christian churches in East Asia seems a little suspicious. Urakami Cathedral was the biggest Christian structure in all of East Asia. The bomb could have been dropped literally anywhere else. Instead, the priests and parishioners were obliterated. The atomic bomb killed two priests and 30 people inside the church instantly. 
Several surviving members of the congregation suffer the horrors of the fallout for the rest of their lives. A new cathedral was built close to where the old one used to stand. The salvaged head of the Virgin Mary is a grim reminder of what happened. It's one of the bleakest statues of the Virgin you'll ever see in your life, blackened and grim, with her hollow stare lifeless and sad. Arrow Quivers The Scythian warriors of the Eurasian steppe were mighty horse lords who may have also been about as sick in the head as Buffalo Bill. They galloped across the grassy landscape, flinging arrows at their enemies and living in nomadic encampments. Their women were legendary warriors, believed to be the inspiration behind the Greek myth of centaurs. The Scythians were all excellent horse riders, according to legend, although surely there must have been one among them that couldn't ride a horse to save their life. They also were believed to be excellent archers, but it turns out they may have also been sick psychopaths, not so different from Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's two TV serial killers I've compared them to now, so you're most likely itching to know what I'm talking about. A team of anthropologists was recently studying Scythian artifacts when they made a creepy discovery. They were curious to see what leather was used to craft their arrow quivers. The researchers were assuming the test would show sheep or horse leather. Instead, the test revealed ancient Scythians were crafting their quivers from human skin. It's the ancient equivalent of making a human skin lampshade. The Scythians, who lived in Ukraine during the 6th century BC, practiced psychological warfare. Experts believe the Scythians used the skin of their victims to make quivers as a way of inspiring fear and terror. What an incredibly ghoulish thing to find out by accident. It adds a whole new layer of bizarre to the legacy of the Scythians. They are already mysterious because they didn't write anything down about themselves. They lived across Siberia, China, Ukraine, and pretty much all of Eurasia from 900 until 200 BC. But the Scythians left little of themselves behind. Preserved records from other civilizations confirm they were pioneers in horseback combat. They were nomadic, they didn't build cities, choosing to live life on the eternal road instead. The Scythians were so closely connected to their horses that modern scholars believe the Greeks got their idea for centaurs from them. Nobody had ever imagined they were flaying humans and using their skin as leather. Ancient Shoes Let's turn our attention from the creepy and disgusting to the mundane yet exciting. In 1938, anthropologist Luther Cressman discovered a mysterious pair of shoes in a cave near Fort Rock, Central Oregon. The shoes turned out to be around 10,200 years old. They are the oldest shoes in the world. I don't know why I think ancient footwear is so interesting. I always love this topic. Although human beings have been wearing shoes for at least 100,000 years, there aren't any physical pairs remaining. Just think about how quickly your shoes deteriorate after a year of walking on pavement. Now imagine your shoes are made from sagebrush and you're chasing an antelope to feed your family. Your shoes are going to be run down pretty quickly. They definitely aren't going to last 100,000 years. These artifacts, well, technically it's one artifact, but there are two of them, are known as the Fort Rock Sandals. You can see them for yourself at the Museum of Natural and Cultural History in Eugene. They were crafted by prehistoric humans using sagebrush bark and fibers. They weren't exactly shoes, but more like sandals. Go out into the yard and weave some strands of grass into flip-flops, and that's basically what you're looking at. Rich Mosaics a stone's throw from the Colosseum in Rome, researchers discovered some of the most incredible mosaics ever. Scientists with the archaeological park of the Colosseum were excavating an ancient home that they think belonged to a Roman senator when they found the mosaics. These beautiful examples of ancient art were made using shells, bits of white marble, pieces of glass, and blue tile from Egypt. Italy's culture minister, Gennaro San Giuliano, described them as an authentic treasure. The mosaics are even older than the empire. They date to the second century BC, which was during the late Republican age of Rome. The mosaics display various figurative scenes. 
One shows a coastal city with tall towers and ships floating restlessly on the ocean waves. The pictures are gorgeous. They appear to be the original decorations of what's known as a domus, the ancient Roman version of a mansion. It was most definitely owned by a wealthy citizen of the upper class. Which rooms do you think the decorated walls were in? If it was your domus, would you put the mosaics in your bedroom, maybe the kitchen or the living room? Researchers think the epic mosaics are located in the home's multiple dining rooms. Roman senators didn't just have one place to eat. They had multiple dining rooms where they hosted expensive banquets. These mosaics would have been set in the wall, where guests could be impressed by the incredible artwork. There is one mosaic in particular that I quite like. It's in what researchers think was the reception room, like a huge foyer. The mosaic features landscapes and lotus leaves pouring from vases, along with tridents and strange musical instruments. The Valley of the Kings If you were to take a stroll through the Valley of the Kings without knowing where you were, it wouldn't be that exciting. You would be walking through a hilly desert covered in sand and blanketed by an endless blue sky. But this isn't a wasteland. It's the most important burial ground in Egyptian history. For 500 years, Egyptian royalty was taken to this desolate wasteland and buried in tombs so deep you would think they'd lead straight to hell. Just kidding. Maybe straight to the underworld. There have been a lot of crazy discoveries found in the Valley of the Kings. Too many to discuss in just one video, so let me focus on the newest discovery of four deposits of artifacts. Egyptologist Afifi Ghanem said the artifacts were buried as part of a ritual right before the construction of a new tomb. It was for good luck. The builders took boxes and filled them with cow heads, vases, flint blades, and other knickknacks. Then they buried them as a ritual to ensure that nobody would die during the construction. As you can imagine, digging tombs was risky business. That's the newest discovery, but what about some crazy old discoveries? In 1922, Howard Carter revealed the tomb of King Tutankhamun right here in the Valley of the Kings. It was this discovery that single-handedly seduced the modern world into fawning over ancient Egypt for the next century. The tomb was filled with incredible and bizarre artifacts. Artifacts like a dagger made from iron that was extracted from a meteorite. He also had another dagger made of solid gold. There was a small wooden chest inside Tut's tomb, which Howard Carter opened to find a leopard head staring back at him. Except the severed head of the leopard was plated with gold. Also in the box was a linen scarf wrapped around a bundle of tiny gold rings. It's believed the scarf belonged to a looter who got caught halfway through trying to pillage the tomb. Then the tomb was sealed, and nobody else entered it for 3,200 years. The Forbidden Pig During a recent excavation that took place in Jerusalem, archaeologists found a pig skeleton. It was discovered buried beneath the rubble of a building that stood 2,700 years ago. The pig's crushed bones make it look as if it were crushed by falling debris. The pig was not alone. As archaeologists continued their investigation, they kept finding more skeletons. They uncovered the bones of cattle, sheep, birds, and gazelles. Many of these animals had clearly been butchered, judging by the cut and burn marks on their bones. Archaeologists also found the shattered remains of cooking pots, meaning these creatures were most certainly consumed. Maybe this building was a restaurant. Maybe it was a fast food joint where you could get a gazelle burger with a side of pro eggs. Nobody really knows, though there is one thing for sure. Pig was on the menu in ancient Jerusalem. If you're familiar with Jewish customs, you'll know that the Jewish people do not eat pigs. Pork is the forbidden meat, not allowed under the laws of Kashrut. The laws come from the Bible, interpreted from the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy. Jewish people are only allowed to consume animals that have cloven hooves and that chew their cud. It must have taken a while to convince everyone to stop eating pigs. Maybe it wasn't widely consumed 2,700 years ago, but some people were definitely eating pork. An X-rated find The ancient city of Viminakium in Serbia was one of the most powerful strongholds of the Roman Empire in Eastern Europe. 
Ancient texts from 2,000 years ago report that roughly 45,000 people lived in the city, protected by two well-armed Roman legions. The city has been excavated since 1882, but only now has an extraordinarily X-rated discovery been revealed to the public. Archaeologists uncovered what they think was a wind chime, only this wind chime wasn't very family-friendly. The wind chime was made from a magical phallus dangling between two legs. It also had wings and a tail, and was decorated with four jingling bells. This was the type of decoration you may have seen hung outside a Roman's front door two millennia ago. It seems weird now, but the artifact isn't as unusual as it seems. Romans were obsessed with phallic-shaped objects. They wore them as amulets around their necks, they made lamps in the shape of male genitalia, they were also obsessed with creating giant mosaics decorated with male parts. Plus, the Romans loved wind chimes, which they believed worked to keep away evil spirits. Romans would hang wind chimes outside their homes, believing the chimes combated evil that tried to enter. They were so popular that wind chimes have been found at the very edges of the Roman Empire in England, way north at Hadrian's Wall. It makes sense that the Romans combined two of their favorite things, wind chimes and male genitalia. Bronze Age Hair Care Prior to the beginning of a road construction project in South Wales, archaeologists completed a small excavation. This is a typical thing that must be done to ensure the construction project doesn't destroy any ancient remains. The archaeologists found a cremation burial from the Bronze Age, circa 1300 BC. Inside the grave was a wooden comb. It revealed some unexpected information about the hair care habits of the ancient Welsh. Researcher Mark Collard said the comb is quite unique. In most Bronze Age cremation burials, archaeologists find bits of metal and other random artifacts. But to find a partially burned wooden comb with eight teeth is something special. It obviously didn't burn along with its original owner during the cremation. Along with the comb, excavators found a small gold ring. The ring also had a lot to do with hair. Turns out, across Britain and Ireland in the Bronze Age, people used artifacts called lock rings to hold their hair. These were small golden rings that had a cone-shaped opening at each end. The best way I can try to explain it is by describing a hair scrunchie, only made of gold. Both men and women had these in their hair, but only if they were wealthy. Elite members of society would have had perhaps dozens of gold scrunchies or little decorations. You might say they were obsessed with their hair. It's why lock rings and combs are found in so many burials. They would also use silver and copper rings to enhance and accent the natural color of their hair. People in the Bronze Age weren't barbarians. They were often just as obsessed with their appearance as people are today. We need a hair lock ring tutorial. Shipwreck Artifacts In Florida, road construction recently revealed an entire shipwreck full of artifacts. Archaeologists revealed shoes, coins, and other awesome relics from a disaster that occurred in 1869. The construction work was standard and routine. Nothing was out of the ordinary until suddenly, road workers struck gold. Well, not literal gold. The wooden remains of a 20-foot-long vessel appeared from about 10 feet underneath the surface. The discovery was made near the Bridge of Lions in St. Augustine. This isn't exactly in the middle of nowhere, but rather right in the center of modern civilization. Archaeologists were reportedly trying to stabilize the vessel and extract it before the wood rapidly decayed. It would have been fine if left underground, but exposure to the air and elements will quickly destroy the remaining pieces of wood. But archaeologists were able to secure a bunch of artifacts. One of the artifacts is an old lantern that must have been used on board to see where the ship was going at night. The lantern was oil-fired, and it was also found near a pair of coconut halves, likely used as drinking cups. But what was the boat for, and how did it get stuck 10 feet underneath a modern city in Florida? Leader of the excavation, Dr. James Delgado, believes the ship was used for fishing and collecting shellfish. It was small, likely only had one mast, and was designed for use in shallow water. This was a scavenger's boat, somebody who pillaged the shallows for anything they could eat or sell. 
How it ended up buried is something that nobody knows. The Orphic Book About 60 years ago, right beside a river in western Bulgaria, road construction led to a truly remarkable discovery. The fact I'm now on the third discovery made during road construction is a really strange coincidence and was not my intention at all. But don't go anywhere because this discovery is way more impressive than the last two. Construction workers found the oldest book in the history of humanity. That's right, the oldest book in existence. It comes from 600 BC and was made of solid gold. It was also written in the extinct language of the Etruscans, a group that's being referred to as the most mysterious ancient people of Europe. That's a lot of information to unravel, so let's start with the physical book. It is an unbelievably cool artifact. The book consists of six pages wrought of 23.82 karat gold. Almost 24, but just a hair off. The pages are connected by a series of gold rings, sort of like a calendar or a child's picture book. You have to flip each page up to get to the next one. Each page is decorated in text and illustrations. There are pictures of horsemen, warriors, mythical monsters, and musical instruments. After its discovery, experts from Bulgaria and England confirmed its authenticity. Scientists at the National Museum of History in Sofia, Bulgaria said the relic is the oldest comprehensive literary work involving multiple pages. Even though the Orphic book, as it's now known, isn't as old as something like the pyramid texts, it's a real book. It isn't a story inscribed on a clay tablet. It isn't a biblical tale written on scraps of papyri. It's a book with a binding, the only one of its kind from thousands of years ago. The Orphic book was authored by one or more Etruscans. Nobody knows exactly where the Etruscans came from, but it was most likely Turkey 3,000 years ago. They settled in central Italy and became the dominant force of the region. Their neighbors, a small tribe of nobodies, didn't seem like a big deal in the beginning, but by the 4th century BC, the Romans had transformed themselves into a big deal. They beat the Etruscans and absorbed them into their growing kingdom. Nobody has understood the Etruscan language since then. For this reason, the Orphic book remains undeciphered. The book is 2,500 years old, but nobody can read it because nobody has ever been able to break the code of the Etruscan writing system. Anyone want to give it a try? Maybe use some AI to crack it? Let me know in the comments. The Extinction of the Beothuk A trove of priceless artifacts has been found in Newfoundland, Canada. Newfoundland is where the Vikings landed when they reached North America 1,000 years ago. Any new find on the island is always very exciting for the archaeological community. But this time, the artifacts have nothing to do with Vikings. They are from a different culture entirely, a culture that may have even destroyed the Vikings in Canada. In 2016, archaeologist Don Pelly discovered a former Beothuk dwelling. The Beothuk were an Algonquian-speaking indigenous tribe that formed as a culture around the year 1500, but their ancestors were much older than that. They had migrated from the mainland to Newfoundland 2,000 years ago, at the same time the Roman Empire was forming. But over the next few centuries, they went through various cultural phases. Beothuk was the name of their final phase when they experienced unimaginable tragedy at the hands of Europeans. Evidence suggests there were only around 1,000 Beothuk people on the island when Italian explorers arrived. They were helpless as the colonists began spreading across their lands like a plague. But it wasn't the first time that colonists had come to their shores. Around the year 1000 AD, it's believed Norse explorers, aka Vikings, encountered an indigenous group in northern Newfoundland. These were the ancestors of the Beothuk, whom the Viking called Skrælingdar. Nobody knows what happened between the Vikings and the indigenous people. But since the Vikings disappeared from the land and the Beothuk didn't, the explorers may have been destroyed. The next Europeans didn't land in Newfoundland until Italian explorer John Cabot in 1497. The Beothuk did all they could to avoid contact with the Europeans. Sadly, it was a losing battle. European settlements continued to grow along the edges of the island, pushing the indigenous people deeper into the middle. 
The last refuge of Newfoundland's indigenous group was Beothuk Lake. Centuries of fighting European diseases had left them weak. They had lost their critical migration routes due to the rapid expansion of colonial towns and cities. They also lost the battle for natural resources, with the perpetually increasing number of Europeans stealing their fish and their wood. For almost 2,000 years, the Beothuk had kept their numbers under about 1,000 and had lived bountifully on the island. That all changed thanks to Europeans. In 1829, the very last of their people died. Shana Dithit was the last Beothuk, the very last member of an entire race of people. It's pertinent to mention that she was captured as a prisoner by English fur trappers, exposed to their sickness, and died of tuberculosis. Just imagine being the last of your people alive on an island, taken over by invaders from another world, then you're captured like an animal and cough yourself to death. That was the end of the Beothuk bloodline. Not much remains of the Beothuk today, which is what made the recent discovery of the former dwelling so exciting. The circular pit was intact, with the walls still standing that had been erected by the Beothuk 200 years before. In recent decades, amateur archaeologists took to Beothuk Lake with metal detectors, digging up every possible artifact and leaving nothing behind. Finding even just one house is a huge deal. This is currently one of the most important sites in Newfoundland. The first step to preserve it was to map the area using drones. Then the land was surveyed while work crews removed trees that could potentially fall on the site. For the last three summers, archaeologists have been hard at work excavating. They have discovered a small trove of important relics from the days of the Beothuk. They found a pair of deer spears, likely taken from a European settlement. The spears were used to kill caribou. Researchers also found a pointed piece of iron that probably came from a harpoon used to hunt seals. While the artifacts aren't necessarily exciting in the sense that they were just tools, they are hugely important to humanity. These ancient weapons are all that's left of a people who went extinct. The Vimana There may have been giant flying machines in India thousands of years ago. I can't say for sure if there were, but it is a possibility based on ancient Hindu texts and some seriously strange artifacts. When I'm talking about the ancient Hindu texts, I'm referring to the Vedas specifically. It is a collection of Hindu verses written between 1500 and 500 BC. The contents of the book were around before, only they were passed down orally for thousands of years. Then, 3,500 years ago, people started writing the ancient legends down. While not confirmed, it's believed the stories in the Vedas date back to the Indus Valley civilization, making them roughly 9,000 years old. The Vedas, just like the Hebrew Bible, can be split into different books. Historians are fairly certain the 100,000 verses spread across the four main books are the same today as they were when originally written, which is something that can't be said for the Bible. The Bible has been translated into so many languages that finding the original words is basically impossible. But the Vedas are still in the same language they were originally written. Now, what about those flying machines? The Vedas contain a lot of information. The text talks about how to properly observe religious rituals, how to properly perform chants and mantras. It also gives instructions for officiating a wedding and overseeing the funeral. There are stories about the formation of the universe, ruminations on the concept of self and truth. The Vedas talk about devotion, rebirth, and the various gods and it details sky chariots that sound suspiciously like flying saucers. According to the Vedas, the ancient gods flew around the sky using chariots known as vimanas. They were royal carriages that zoomed around in the air. They took the gods way up into the sky. They could travel vast distances, and they could even move through time. Vimanas are not only represented in the Vedas, they can also be found across India, depicted in ancient artwork. Stories from a thousand years ago speak of something called Vimanagriya, a sort of vehicle hangar where Vimanas were stored. Vimanas supposedly looked exactly like what people today think spaceships look like, but these were not vehicles to be used by the common folk. They were strictly for the gods, 
who disappeared in their flying chariots on a whim. Could these flying machines have been real? Were they planetary vehicles used by powerful aliens whom the Indus Valley civilization understood as gods? And could one of these artifacts still be around somewhere on this planet? Maybe locked in a government facility somewhere, like Area 51. What do you think about all this? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. The Egg Cliff In a small rural Chinese village, there is a cliff that lays eggs. Not a man named Cliff who lays eggs, but an actual rock face that manages to produce enormous round rocks that look an awful lot like dinosaur eggs. Some of them are supposedly as heavy as 600 pounds. According to the locals, it takes about three decades for one of these stone eggs to be pushed out of the cliff and fall down on the ground as an almost perfectly egg-shaped stone treasure. It's a phenomenon which scientists have not yet been able to figure out. It's one of the weirdest mysteries on Earth, and experts are stumped. This mysterious cliff is located in the Gizu province near Gulujai village. This happens to be the ancestral homeland of the Shui people, who have occupied the area for over 1,000 years. The part of the rock face which lays eggs is about 66 feet long, and a seemingly random part of an unnamed mountain. These stone eggs grow extremely slowly on the cliff face, getting more and more pronounced as time goes on. You can see them right now pushing out of the rock, but nobody knows when exactly one will detach itself and fall to the ground. When one of them does fall down, Whichever villager is lucky enough to find it will take it home and worship it. As far as we know, there are about 100 of these stone eggs in the village, kept as sacred objects by the families. The Tring Tiles Hiding in a special cabinet inside the medieval galleries at the British Museum is a set of very mysterious ceramic tiles. These tiles are very unique, discovered years ago in the Victorian era when restoration was being done to the Tring Parish Church. Their importance was immediately recognized, and they were taken away by someone unknown, stashed somewhere safe, and passed down through generations until they eventually found their way to the museum. The tiles come from the 14th century, masterfully created using a technique known as graffito. There is only three of these very special tiles. No others have been found in Britain made using the same technique. Some have been found in France, but absolutely none on the British Isles. Nobody knows why they were used at the Tring Parish Church. Even more mysterious is what's on the tiles. Each one depicts scenes from the childhood of Jesus Christ, but the scenes are a bit strange. Actually, strange hardly describes just how bizarre the scenes are. One scene is of a group of children being stuffed into an oven, seemingly by Jesus himself. Another shows him blessing a family feast and the other shows him performing miracles. The miracles are pretty standard, but Jesus putting kids in an oven is definitely a little off the books. To this day, no one knows why the tiles ended up in the church, or who created the curious pictures. The Kumakivi Balancing Rock In Finnish legend, the Kumakivi Balancing Rock was created by giants. And while that may seem completely unrealistic, science hasn't really come up with a better explanation. The bizarre Kumakivi rock, which translates to English as strange rock, can be found in the middle of the forest in Finland. It is a massive boulder, an enormous stone that could crush your house, and it's balancing perfectly on another, much smaller stone. It's so strange that ever since ancient people discovered it, they made up fantastical stories on how the stone got there. The ancient people figured the only thing that made sense was giants. However, scientists say it was glaciers. The only explanation modern researchers can come up with is that as the glaciers, which once covered pretty much all of Finland, retreated 8,000 years ago, they carried giant rocks and pieces of debris with them. And as the glacier, which carried this particular giant rock, slowly dissipated, it dumped the rock in the precarious position we find it in now. It was a total fluke that the gigantic boulder ended up balanced on the smaller rock, and a miracle that it hasn't yet tipped over. And while there is no way to scientifically prove beyond any doubt that it was glaciers, it still makes a bit more sense than giants performing a balancing act with stones thousands of years ago. What do you think? The Zone of Silence The Zone of Silence doesn't contain any strange artifacts, 
but it's certainly one of the most bizarre and mysterious places in the world. It's an infamously magical place in Durango, Mexico. Radio and television signals allegedly get scrambled when brought over the invisible line into the zone of silence. Locals say compasses don't function properly, and some people have allegedly been seen vanishing like ghosts into thin air. This place has been called the Bermuda Triangle of Mexico, and nobody can quite figure out why so many peculiar things happen here. Even stranger is that in 1970, the U.S. accidentally dropped an Athena rocket in the area. It sank in the dirt, and American soldiers had to go dig it out. According to the experts, though, this isn't what makes the zone unusual. The disruption in technology, the disappearances, it's all being blamed on three main things. First, subterranean deposits of magnetite. Second, the debris from meteorites which impact this part of the desert with abnormal frequency. And third, celestial activity, particularly visits from extraterrestrials. Which one makes the most sense to you? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. The Maya Volcano City A team of archaeologists recently explored a lost Maya city that collapsed inside of a volcano crater. Like something straight out of a sci-fi movie, a literal city was found inside the mouth of a volcano. Of course, the volcano hasn't been active for a very long time. It's actually flooded 5,000 feet above sea level in the highlands of Guatemala. This city was built around 400 BC and was once a thriving Maya metropolis. There were hundreds of houses, grand temples dedicated to powerful Maya gods, and everything else you would expect in an ancient Maya city. These days, though, it's submerged in the volcanic Lake Atitlan. The city is beneath about 65 feet of water, and according to Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology, it was a catastrophic event which led the city to collapse and the local people to flee. The only issue is that nobody is really sure what this event was. All we know is that something major happened and the mouth of the volcano flooded. To make things even more mysterious, this is the third lost city found inside the flooded volcano. There is also Samabaj and Chutnamit, both of which suffered the same mysterious fate roughly 1,800 years ago. The Anti-Gravity Stone Pillar the anti-gravity stone pillar in the Indian state of Karnataka is a marvel of engineering. This state has the second largest number of historical monuments, covered in Hindu temples, amazing pieces of 12th century Hindu architecture, and thousands of sculptures and carved ornate pillars. But the anti-gravity pillar is absolutely unique. Located in the Vijayana Rayana Temple of Belur, commissioned by a king around 1117 AD, it took 103 years to complete the temple, which is dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu. Here's why the pillar is considered one of the great architectural mysteries of India. It stands 42 feet tall and is a monolithic pillar carved of soapstone with no base or any kind of foundation. It's standing on a platform carved out of granite in the shape of a star, with nothing to make it stand firmly. It has no support, it's not fixed to the platform with any kind of mortar, and it's only standing on three sides. There is a giant gap underneath it and the granite star. Yet miraculously, it shows no sign of falling over. It's been there for nearly 1,000 years, defying gravity. To put this in perspective, it's like if you stood a pencil almost 50 feet tall on its eraser end, left it standing, and it never fell down. The White Pyramid The White Pyramid of Xi'an in China truly is the stuff of legends. In the 1940s, a group of U.S. service members reported seeing a pure white pyramid standing roughly 1,000 feet tall. If true, that would make this the tallest pyramid in the world. The issue these days is that nobody else has ever seen it. And to be completely honest, the story is a little out there. In 1945, a United States Army Air Corps pilot named James Gossman saw a huge, pure white pyramid capped with a jewel as he flew over Xi'an. Two years later, Colonel Maurice Sheehan told the New York Times the exact same thing. They even ran an article in 1947. Here's the thing. In the region around Xi'an, there are about 400 pyramids. These aren't like the ancient pyramids of Egypt. They are more like giant mounds of grass and dirt. These monuments were made of soil, sticks, and rocks, and now they've decayed quite a bit. 
but because of the sheer number of overgrown pyramids in the region, it's not a far stretch to think there could be a giant white one. The big mystery now is that if these US service members really did see it, where in the world did it go? King John's Lost Treasure A metal detectorist in England believes he has just discovered an ancient lost treasure on a farm in an old English village. His name is Raymond Koschuk, and he came across a small collection of medieval artifacts from 800 years ago. He didn't reveal the exact location of the site for fear of having his treasure taken away from him by other people with metal detectors. However, he does say the property once belonged to King John of England, and that the treasures he found are only a small fraction of the large hoard buried somewhere beneath the dirt. The legend of the treasure goes back to the year 1216. King John, who signed the Magna Carta just a year before his death, was crossing what back then was called the Wash. This was an estuary dividing the areas of Lincolnshire and Norfolk. Legend has it that as the king was crossing the Wash, he lost a great and valuable treasure. Before he could go back and get it, he died of dysentery because he drank poisoned ale. The treasure has been missing ever since. Some historians say it's just a legend, but John believes it's real. All he's found so far are some random artifacts, things like nails and metal buckles. But he's sure that somewhere down there is a whole heap of gold, sapphires, emeralds, and big juicy rubies. Mystery Altar and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is by far the holiest place in all of the Holy Land. The church was supposedly built upon the very site where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and later resurrected. This itself makes it one of the most mystical and mysterious places especially religiously speaking, on our planet. But in recent days, a much more tangible mystery has been unveiled. Against a wall in the very back of the church, archaeologists rediscovered a stone slab, which was once used as an altar in the medieval days. This slab, which had been pushed against the back wall and completely forgotten about for centuries, was once a piece of a medieval high altar used inside the sanctuary during the main liturgy of the church. The altar was almost certainly part of the main structure sometime around 1149 and was used by the Catholic clergy for celebrating Mass during the days of the Crusaders. In fact, it was used all the way up until the Crusaders abandoned Jerusalem. Afterward, the altar was used by the Greek Orthodox priests up until 1808. That was when a fire swept through the church, damaged the altar, and it was thrown in the back. It then sat there completely forgotten for over 200 years. The Royston Cave The Royston Cave is located beneath the streets of the town of Royston in Hertfordshire, England. It's one of the most mysterious caves in not only England, but the entire world. What we know is that the cave is definitely man-made. It was constructed in the shape of a bell, a sunken chamber carved into the bedrock underneath the junction of a prehistoric Roman trackway called the Icknield Way and the ancient Roman road called Ermine Street, which once connected the city of London to York. The cave itself measures roughly 24 feet in height and about 15 feet in diameter. There was once an octagonal podium inside and a wooden frame that divided the cavern into two levels and supported a raised wooden platform. However, these artifacts have since decayed, and we don't really know what they were used for. Now comes the good part. The cave is decorated in some of the most chaotic cave carvings that have ever been found anywhere. The walls are decorated in weird carvings that appear to have major religious significance. We see images of the crucifixion, carvings of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Israel, along with images of the Holy Family, St. Catherine and St. Lawrence, and other important figures from the 13th century. There are also carvings of Jesus Christ, his disciples, and heaps of saints and martyrs. The mystery is that nobody knows what the Royston Cave was used for or who built it. One of the prevailing theories is that the dark underground cavern was used as a secret meeting place for important members of the Knights Templar. History tells us they had a stronghold in the nearby town of Balduk, and so it makes sense that they had their secret meeting place nearby. However, nobody knows if this theory is true. We also don't know when the cave was abandoned or what it was used for. The Ben Ben Stone 
The Ben Ben Stone was sacred to the Egyptians, who kept it in a temple dedicated to the god Atum in the ancient city of Heliopolis. Ben Ben is also a term that's used to describe the tip of an obelisk or the capstone of a pyramid. There are several creation stories in ancient Egyptian mythology. According to one, the Ben Ben Stone rose from the dark waters of a primordial abyss called Nu, where it served as a landing place for Atum. At the time, the world consisted only of darkness and chaos. Upon landing, Atum realized that he was all alone and that the world was a rather depressing place. He began creating life and gods and had them take over the creation process while he remained on the Ben Ben Stone. At some point, Atum began to worry about the gods he had created, so he removed his eye and sent it on a search mission. The eye returned with the gods, causing Atum to shed tears of joy onto the stone, which then turned into people. If the original Ben Ben Stone ever really existed, it's since been lost. Some say that the artifact itself and the city it was located in, Heliopolis, were made by aliens. The conspiracy theories associated with ancient Egyptian culture abound, and this is simply one of many. Perhaps because this ancient culture had such fascinating and iconic symbols, structures, and cultural practices that alien intervention seems to be the only explanation. Zersivan Castle Located in modern-day Turkey's Diyarbakir province, Zersivan Castle is a remote ruin that sits atop a hill overlooking a vast plain. It dates back 3,000 years and has been destroyed and rebuilt several times since it fell under Assyrian control during ancient times. The structure was last rebuilt during the Roman era, during which time it had a legion of 1,200 soldiers. Zerzivan was abandoned after falling under Islamic rule and has remained uninhabited for some 1,400 years. Excavations that took place in 2014 found everything in its original place. The castle and its contents were astonishingly intact, thanks to not being used or touched in so long. Inside the castle, there is a temple of Mithras. There are only 22 such temples known throughout the world, and the one at Zerzivan is the best preserved of them all. Mithraism is older than Christianity. It's a mysterious ancient Roman religion that worshipped the god Mithras and placed a high importance on the celestial bodies. It inspired the soldiers at Zerzivan Castle to take an interest in the night sky and involved secret rituals and initiations. Archaeologists have found numerous symbols here that they can't explain or find in any historical sources. They believe that the symbols have something to do with the Mithras cult. There are rumors throughout the province that several American families whose names frequently pop up in conspiracy theories have visited the temple at Zerzivan and participated in strange rituals. Whatever the case, it seems as though the experts agree on the site's importance. Zerzivan Castle was added to UNESCO's World Heritage tentative list last year and reportedly has a high chance of entering the permanent list. Bet's Mystery Sphere In 1974, a family living in Fort George Island, Florida, claimed to have found a strange metal sphere in their backyard. Measuring 8 inches in diameter and weighing 22 pounds, it was smaller and heavier than a bowling ball. At first, the family believed that it was a cannonball left behind by Spanish colonizers. But the object, nicknamed the Betts Mystery Sphere after its finders, was unusually clean and shiny for an object that old, or that had been sitting in the ground for that long. It also seemed to be made of stainless steel, which was not used during the colonial period. On top of all that, the sphere seemed to have a mind of its own. Out of nowhere, it began moving around on its own, vibrating and making unexplainable noises. When one family member played the guitar, the ball reacted by making a throbbing noise. One day, while the Betts family rolled the ball back and forth on the floor, it randomly changed directions and returned to the person who rolled it last. The family's dog also responded strangely to the sphere by crying and covering her ears with her paws. The U.S. military supposedly ran their own tests on the ball. Speaking with local papers, household matriarch Jerry Betts had claimed that an independent examiner found radio waves and a magnetic field surrounding the object. A Navy spokesperson, on the other hand, told the newspaper that while they were unable to identify the sphere, they believe that it's man-made and that it's harmless. 
Conspiracy theorists believe that the ball was created using advanced ancient alien technology. To this day, however, the claims about its strange behavior remain questionable, leading most to agree with the military's conclusion that it's an ordinary object. What do you think about this mysterious sphere? Let me know in the comments below. The Georgia Guidestones In Albert County, Georgia, there is a collection of six granite tablets arranged in the shape of a star. Known as the Georgia Guidestones and nicknamed the American Stonehenge, they are engraved with a series of rules that their commissioner believes people need to follow in order to restore humanity after an apocalypse. At the top of the monument, there is a short message written in four languages, Greek, Babylonian cuneiform, Sanskrit, and Egyptian hieroglyphics. The rules themselves are written in eight languages, including English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. Included among the ten guidelines are rules such as balance personal rights with social duties, rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason, and be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature. In 1979, a man wishing to conceal his identity hired a local granite finishing company to build a monument containing instructions for the re-establishment of society. The parties involved agreed to destroy the structure's plans once it was built. The strange man went by the pseudonym R.C. Christian and had seemingly limitless money for the project. He insisted on all information regarding his identity being strictly withheld from the public. There are several conspiracy theories about who he was, including rumors that the New World Order or the Satanists were behind the Guidestones. These far-flung ideas have led to extreme vandalism, but have not brought anyone closer to identifying the monument's real commissioner. To this day, all that's known about the anonymous sponsor is that they are, according to a statement on the monument itself, a small group of Americans who seek the age of reason. So, who do you think might be behind the commission of these rules for re-establishing society after an apocalypse? Leave your theories or guesses in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss any more videos. The Wedge of Ayud The Wedge of Ayud is an out-of-place artifact, something that doesn't fit the time, place, or context in which it is found. Discovered in Romania in 1974, the 4 to 5 pound aluminum wedge supposedly dates back at least 11,000 years to a time long before aluminum was discovered. A group of construction workers reportedly discovered the wedge buried beneath 35 feet of sand alongside two mastodon bones. An anonymous donor gifted the item to the Museum of History of Transylvania, where it sat unacknowledged in a storage room until 1995, when editors from a UFO magazine rediscovered it. Based on the mastodon bones it was found next to, the stone could be anywhere from 11,000 to several million years old. But it hasn't been scientifically dated, and there could perhaps be another explanation for why the object was found where it was. Metallic aluminum did not exist until 1825, causing many people to dive headfirst into theories about the wedge having extraterrestrial origins. Some pseudoscience enthusiasts believe that it's a piece of landing gear from an ancient alien spacecraft. Others think that a time traveler from the future left the wedge behind during a hasty departure to escape a mastodon attack. Much to the dismay of conspiracy theorists, the wedge is most likely a tooth shed from an excavator and is indeed very modern in origin. It appears aged because it's made of a type of aluminum that oxidizes rapidly but there is little doubt among experts that the wedge is anything but ancient and that it probably fell off a construction machine. Chinese Sword in North America In 2014, an amateur artifact hunter allegedly discovered a partially exposed ancient Chinese sword beside a stream in the state of Georgia. It's one of several seemingly Chinese artifacts that have turned up in the United States in recent years. The 12-inch long weapon was provisionally identified as being made from a rare mineral called lizardite, which is found in both the northern and southern hemispheres. But more tests are needed to determine the material's type and origin with any certainty. The sword is reportedly the only object of its type ever found in North America. To some, this means that people traveled to the continent from China during the pre-Columbian era. If this were to be true, it would rewrite history and our understanding of past human movement. But tests showed that the soil around the sword was disturbed at some point, 
and experts have failed to identify many of the symbols and shapes on the sword. Some scholars contend that the artifact reflects a possible connection between ancient Chinese and Olmec symbolism. The debate has been ongoing for over a century. Unfortunately, there is little follow-up to articles announcing the sword's discovery in 2015, leaving the world to wonder if it is a genuine artifact, and if so, when and where it came from. But it's probably safe to say that mainstream experts didn't buy into the hype, or we'd be hearing a lot more about it. The London Hammer While out for a walk with his secret lover in London, Texas in 1936, a man named Max Hahn discovered an artifact made from wood and iron embedded in a 400-million-year-old rock. It's been inconclusively dated to sometime between 700 years ago and today, leaving the question of how it ended up in such an ancient rock formation. Han and his girlfriend allegedly noticed some loose rock during their walk and pulled a chunk out of it. They took the piece home, where it sat for a decade, until the couple's son, Max Jr., broke the rock open and found the hammer inside. Archaeologists are skeptical about the discovery, to say the least, especially since it went unnoticed for so many years while in Han's possession. Christian theorists suggest that the hammer is a pre-flood artifact that was used by a society that lived amongst the dinosaurs. Other experts contend that the hammer is consistent with 19th century tools that were used in the area. Today, the object is on display at the Creation Evidence Museum in Texas, perhaps indicating that the scientific community doesn't want anything to do with it. Ancient African Artifacts in South America Some researchers believe it's possible that Africans made contact with people in South America long before Christopher Columbus sailed to the New World in 1492. According to one theory, a king named Abukari II led a voyage to the continent from what is now Mali around 1300, and some scholars even believe that Africans reached South America much earlier than that. Writing for an African publication in 2018, Nduta Waweru claimed that archaeologists have discovered artifacts in South America that indicate an African presence as far back as sometime between 13,000 BC and 600 AD. Evidence suggests that people from Aksum, Meroe, and the land of Punt settled in South America during that time period, according to Waweru, who said that African skulls have been found in Ecuador, Chile, and Peru. Plus, there are alleged similarities between African and South American religions that may point toward the possibility of pre-Columbian contact, including images of their gods. There are also correlations between early medical practices found on both continents, such as trepanning, which involved drilling holes in the skull to relieve pressure on the brain. Archaeologists have reportedly found pots and water jars from the land of Punt off the South American coast and Columbus himself supposedly described the people he encountered as dark-skinned. These claims haven't been proven and are widely rejected by mainstream experts, but more people are opening their minds to the possibility as the narrative of who arrived in the Americas first after Native Americans constantly changes as we learn more about history. There are also theories that people from other continents, including Asia, Oceania, and Europe, beat Columbus to the Americas. So far, researchers have already proven that the Vikings set foot in North America long before Columbus did. But if some of these other beliefs are true, they could rewind the arrival of outsiders to the New World not just by hundreds, but perhaps thousands of years. The Dropa Stones Legend holds that in 1938, an archaeologist named Dr. Chi Pu Te discovered 716 stone discs inside a cave during an expedition to China's Bayan Har Mountains. Measuring 9 inches in diameter, they were covered in little grooves and hieroglyphics. When played on a record player, the discs supposedly emitted a low-frequency humming sound. A professor reportedly claimed that the discs, known as the Dropa Stones, featured stories of a UFO crash landing near the caves 12,000 years ago. The spacecraft's crew, known as the Dropa Aliens, tried to build new lives on Earth, but were hunted and killed by the locals. When nobody believed the professor's claims, he resigned from his job. The Dropa Stones disappeared and haven't been seen since. Mainstream experts reject this story entirely, arguing that the artifacts are merely the product of a long-standing tall tale.
The archaeologist and professor who allegedly found and studied the stones were never proven to have existed, and the same goes for the Dropa stones themselves. The story of these artifacts first surfaced in 1960 and was published again in 1962 and 64. Two versions of it credit a false news agency as their source, but the claims nevertheless spread, and many people believe that the Dropa stones are real, including conspiracy theorists and people who don't like to fact check. What do you think? Did these strange ancient discs actually exist and were then covered up? Maybe the story got twisted? Or is the whole thing a hoax? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye!